Brother Laurie is going to be talking about time machines. Woo! Time machines and clocks. He solved it. The age of <laughs> We're going back. All right, back to the place. Okay. Right. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I'm Laurie. I'm going to talk about time machines, clocks, and timekeeping. Uh, my, my day job is more software, computers, screens, all that kind of stuff. And I think, as you mentioned before, I'm also at the uh, Engineer Cafe doing a lot of events and things like that. But I thought, you know, this is a bit of a hobby I picked up in the last two years when I didn't really have anywhere to go, didn't really have anything to do. So I started making clocks. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd just share some of my kind of hobby knowledge. Uh, when it comes to the questions, might not be able to answer many of them, but we'll see how we go. So let's go back in time to basically the most basic clock. And of course, that is the sundial. So uh, we're talking sort of prehistory sort of time. You just shove a pole in the ground or in a wall, and then you mark off equal divisions. Interesting to link up with uh, Adam's talk. Uh, 12 hours in a day. Why 12 hours in a day? No? Apparently, well, one explanation is counting on knuckles. If you count on your finger knuckles, you can count 12 uh, on one hand. I mean, we don't really know, but these are essentially 12 equal lines divided onto a wall, giving you 12 hours. Thumb doesn't count. Yeah, please count how many fingers you've got. If you've got four fingers, it works great. Uh, <laughs> So these are all like equal divisions. The problem with this is, does anyone know the problem? What happens if it's cloudy? Well, that does no, yeah, it doesn't work <laughs> if it's cloudy. But a slightly more nuanced problem is if we divide equally, the time that is swept out by the shadow changes. Mm -hmm. So one hour is um, shorter in the midday and longer in the evening. So you don't get equal hours. So sometimes people call these unequal time sundials or uh, equal angle sundials. Um, so we have to kind of fix it. So you start to notice after getting into kind of more modern times, a few hundred years ago, or probably a bit more than that, we get these kind of closer divisions here and further apart divisions at the end. So these are equal hour sundials, right? So the time swept out. This one is from uh, King's College, Cambridge. And uh, we've, we've done the correction so that now our hours are equal. And also, if you're interested in kind of time history, this, is, this talk's not about Japanese clocks, but Japanese clocks for a long time had unequal hours, even in mechanical clocks. Oh. So they would have summer and winter hours were just the time from sunup to sundown divided mm -hmm. equally. So longer hours in the summer, shorter hours in the winter. But people started doing it like this. And uh, a lot of these clocks appear on sort of church walls, places of worship, that kind of thing, because people wanted to do calls to prayer and uh, religious meetings and things like that at particular times, particular hours. OK, but there's still a problem. There's still a problem because based on your time at midday, you can kind of observe the sun overhead and notice that Sometimes of the year, you're a little bit fast. Your sundial's a little bit fast. And sometimes of the year, your sundial's a little bit slow. Because these are based on a, a geometric idea that the sun and the moon, sorry, the sun and the earth are kind of orbiting very equally. And they keep you know, fixed positions in space and orbit in nice ellipses. And in reality, it doesn't quite work like that. You have to compensate for the fact that you'll be a little bit closer, a little bit further away during the year. And so this is where this thing called the equation of time pops in. And this is equation in the kind of older sense of the word, not a mathematical equation, but of making two things equal. So by you're fixing time by correcting for the fact that sometimes you're a bit ahead and sometimes a bit, a, a, a bit late. So we actually see some modern sundials that have fixed the equation of time. This is another little sundial. So if you see at the top, You've got the hours with unequal uh, spaces, so equal hours, right? Same amount of time per hour. And then down here, they've given you a correction factor <laughs> that you can calculate yourself. So you've got a little graph here, and if it's January, you're uh, 10 minutes, and, and June, you're five minutes, and so on, so on. So you can fix uh, your time and get pretty accurate time um, with, with sundials. But it kind of raises the question that 
if everyone can meet at midday, if everyone can meet at dawn, you know, why do you, why do you need time? Why even bother going more accurate than this? And, and as you mentioned, yeah, OK, maybe you want clocks that work without the sun, work at night, stuff like that. I don't know what suspicious things everyone gets up to at night. Nothing fun happens at night. Um, but we start to develop sort of more advanced clocks. So I've got a bit of a, bit of a clock quiz. Uh, what even is a clock? And basically, it's something that keeps a regular rhythm and something that does the counting for you. It kind of checks uh, how many ticks, how many beats you've had. So here's the quiz. I'm going to show you some, uh, some clocks, and you're going to tell me what ticks and what keeps count. And I want those people to shout things out. I got some uh, clock-based prizes in here. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you'll have fun. So OK, what ticks and what counts? Shout out, guys. The sand. Does what? Clicks. Yeah, and what counts? The glass? No, nope. the sand. It's just the sand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's really simple, right? What ticks? Falling grains of sand. What counts? A pile of sand. And you notice that basically in all the early clocks, like sundials, it's all the same thing. Because they notice that some process happens slowly, and they notice we can find a, a simple way to count it, like with the shadow on the sundial. Um, so they make clocks out of it. So that's the hourglass. Pretty simple, basic clock. A bit more tricky one. Everyone ready? Everyone wants to win a wonderful prize. Oh, another way. What's this? What ticks and what counts? Is it water? It's not water. It's a good guess, though. Oil. oil. Who said oil? Me. Yes. <laughs> OK. What ticks and what counts? It's oil. Uh, how does it do it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Heat. Close. Volume. Fire. Yes, fire. Oh, this oh, is oh, a oh, lamp. Oh, so I'm going to give it to Dan. If you want to click your prize, one. <laughs> Uh, do you want big or small? Are you a big guy or a small guy? Um, <laughs> big. big. I'll give you one. Uh, Engineer Cafe branded hey! sundial. Hey! Okay. We'll see if it works. It's calibrated <laughs> to the latitude of dancing penguin. So <laughs> okay, so yeah. Um, this is burning wax and oil. So the similar idea with candles as well. We got falling nails on the left. Why would you want falling nails to do the counting for you? Why is why is that a good clock? What's that for? It's an alarm clock. You put a metal plate at the bottom. You have falling nails when they hit the candle burns down. Boom! You get a you get a big sound and you wake up and you start a fire. Hopefully, or well, not not hopefully. Okay, next one. Everyone ready? Prizes. What takes and what counts? What is it? Metronome, right? Does it only tick? Yes! Oh, you didn't fall into the trap. It's not a clock. OK. Uh, you definitely get a prize for that one. Do you want a big one or a small one? Give me a small one. Small one? Mini sundial for you. Uh, careful. Yeah, portable sundial. Wrist mounted. Yeah. So you can see how here, you know, we've got the basic idea of a clock, but we're not doing any counting. Uh, and to be honest, this is a modern invention. It doesn't really have anything to do with the history of clocks. I just wanted to try and trap someone, and you beat me. So well done. OK, let's keep going. Uh, what ticks and what counts? Swing, pendulum. Pendulum. The pendulum swings. What counts? The hands. The hands, right? The clock face, the hands. I've got to give you that. Do you want a big one or a small one? <laughs> give you a big one. One, engineer, cafe, branded sundial. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And so this is kind of key to precision timekeeping. Uh, the pendulum swings at a regular rate, and the clock face keeps count of everything that's going on. Same thing here. Mechanical wristwatch, what's going on? What takes, what counts? The gears are No. Mm. Ooh, the <laughs> Not the quartz. I think the gears is almost right, but not right enough. Because there's um, a spinning piece which essentially emulates a pendulum. It spins back and forth. Uh -huh. The gears are not for ticking. And that's something we'll look at in a second with my spring. model. Hmm? Spring? The spring is for power. So it's essentially, a, we call it a balance wheel. Uh -huh. It's the same principle as the uh, pendulum, but we kind of condense it down and fit it on a wristwatch. Uh, so again, quite a modern clock. Uh, what ticks? What counts? Quartz crystal. Quartz crystal. 
and the digital display counts. So, would you like a tiny, a tiny uh, sundial? Who, who answered that? Sorry. Ah, yeah. Awesome. There you go. Okay. So yeah. Again, oscillating quartz atoms, kind of going back and forth. Very, very regular frequency. And then we just add a bit of circuitry to um, kind of find out how many ticks we've had. So the basic idea of all these clocks is that. Uh, so a little model I brought with me is a little clock that I made. Um, and so I think your, your comment, I had to uh, skip the pendulum because it wouldn't fit on my bicycle. So essentially, it should have a big, long, sort of meter-long pendulum stuck on the back there. Uh, when s that would swing back and forth with this regular rhythm. So that's kind of my prop for that. And then the key part, and you can come and have a quick look later, is the escapement, which is this part here. The pendulum essentially moves the wheel around and keeps it moving at a regular pace. And you said gears as part of like what, keeps, uh, what keeps time. All these gears are doing, this kind of very fancy, complicated looking thing, is speeding up the movement close enough so you can see. So I, I think when I first made a clock, I kind of looked at the gears and thought, oh, the, the gears must be doing so much complicated stuff. And it's just slowing down, just like your bicycle gears or your car gears, and displaying the spinning here. All the really important clock stuff is happening at the top. The swinging, the escapement, and the, uh, the moving wheel. And there's also, not shown here, is a falling weight, which would be turning this wheel slowly, and it would be stopped by the uh, pendulum. So I'll leave this here, and people can definitely come and have a look. Uh, or do you want to pass it around? Yeah, sure. It's uh, a little bit like sharp in places, so just watch where you hold it. <laughs> because uh, instead of buying fancy, <laughs> instead of machine parts, I just use nails for all the uh, axles. So, oh, that's right. <laughs> so like, like hold the bits of wood, don't hold the nails. Uh, OK. Yeah. So um, basically, what I just said, mechanical clocks have a falling weight, giving some power. They have a pendulum doing the ticking, and they keep count on a little bit of a clock face. And that's what all the fancy gears are for. The clock face is just speeding up so you can get a second hand, or a, min a minute hand, or an hour hand, so you can watch what's going on, speeding up and slowing down the speed. OK, so um, why bother making a clock? If we all said, oh, OK, after work, let's meet up for drinks. If I'm an hour early or an hour late, it doesn't really matter, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give the talk when I damn well want. I was early today. I'll, I'll add that underline. But there are some very good historical reasons for making clocks. And I'll introduce a little bit of a puzzle. Um, what is this? Can you, what, what is this? Where is this? Does anyone know? Or anyone got an idea? Get, guess? Greenwich. Yeah, well, Greenwich. Greenwich is the right answer. And what are we looking at? International Daylight. Yeah, well, the International Daylight is in Greenwich, but it's not in this picture. Okay. Um, it, I'm looking at this. What's this for? So, <laughs> not the direction, but drops on the hour is essentially the right answer. So, if you remember, uh, you know, New York, the ball drop timing, dropping balls has this time relation. This is the original ball dropping. So, this is for all the ships on the River Thames to calibrate their clocks by. So that when the ball drops, it's exactly midday and they know what time it is, they, they twi twiddle their dials, and then they go off sailing. So why does a ship want to know what time it is? Anyone? Weather pattern. Weather pattern, not quite weather pattern, something longitude. different. Uh, I think I had the key word over there, longitude. So location, they want to know where they are. Then they're sailing, they want to know where they are. Latitude, so up and down on the map is relatively easy. Take a look at the stars, measure some angles, you can do it. Longitude, not so easy. If you know the time, you can work it out. But if you um, don't know your location, you're in trouble. So this used to happen a lot. People go looking for an island or a peninsula. They'd sail the latitude, and they'd go, OK, we know our latitude. We know we're here or here. Do you want to sail east or west? Which way do we go? And then the captain has to make a, a real decision and go, let's sail. OK, we're, maybe we're here. Uh, let's sail west. And actually, we were here. We sailed over here, we drank all the rum, we ate all the food, everyone died. And so the people just used to lose ships all the time because they, they went the wrong way and they didn't know where they were going. And sometimes they even kind of went this way and said, no, we must be going the wrong way. And they went back this way and they kept changing their mind because they weren't sure if they're in the right place. And you've got to imagine just thousands of miles of, of sea. So you didn't know where you were going. So let's put a clock 
on a ship. Easy, right? Hang on a minute. That pendulum, not going to work so well when you're rolling through storms and waves and, and all this stuff. So you miss the island, you run out of rum, everyone dies. Uh, so the British government put up this big challenge, let's make accurate clocks. And this is what kind of caused uh, John Harrison, one of the kind of famous early clock makers, to make these extremely accurate, uh, extremely resilient clocks. He spent years and years kind of working away uh, on these clocks. And to cut a long story short, they kind of met the challenge, but there was a lot of issues with not being the right class and the, the kind of aristocracy not wanting to give him the award and stuff. But, but these clocks were fantastic pieces. If you go to, uh, I think there's a couple of them in the Greenwich uh, Observatory. If you go to London, there's a couple more in a few other museums around there. So you can actually go see the, the physical things he made. And they're the first real accurate time piecing, uh, timekeeping pieces. So, uh, this is when kind of clocks became these useful tools and people just started making more and more mechanical clocks. Um, this is a mechanical clock with a pendulum again. Uh, notice the pendulum's in a special box on the left and the right. Why put the pendulum in a special box? Well, vacuum chamber, pump out all the air, keep the temperature controlled, use double pendulums in opposite directions so they don't influence each other. These are incredibly accurate mechanical clocks. We're talking like about 100 years ago, just after that. They were sold as a product so that people could uh, make time signals in scientific laboratories. Uh, and they were basically just adding more and more tricks, adding more and more cool stuff to, to get the clock to work even more accurately. And they're really, really cool things. And then someone discovered quartz, and they came obsolete in a, you know, instantly. <laughs> so we don't really use mechanical clocks apart from fashion pieces now. But if we look at other clocks, this is what a modern clock looks like, a modern accurate clock. It's an atomic clock, so just measuring uh, the CD and atoms going back and forth. I, I do like the guy at the top who said this is the first atomic wristwatch. He just got one of these, he just got one of these 20 kilo kind of atomic clock time signal machines and put it on his wrist with a couple of straps. Um, but if you have one of these type of watches, they get a time signal through the radio waves and that will originate in something like this somewhere in a, in a meteorological room or a metrological room or something like that. Um, but we don't really think about time so much these days, apart from the fact that probably everyone here used an atomic clock today. Can you think where and what you did that might have involved atomic clocks and time signals? So, what was that? Was it this thing? It's related to that thing, related to a phone? GPS. GPS is the right answer. So. Accurate clocks and accurate timekeeping is really, really important for GPS and GPS satellites to calculate exactly where you are. Because if you think about it, if you're off by one nanosecond with a beam of light going through a vacuum, you're off by about a foot, about 30 centimeters. And if you're off by a microsecond, which is still a very short amount of time, you're off by 300 meters. And uh, one millisecond, which is kind of getting towards stuff we can imagine, and you're not at Dancing Penguin, you're in Kagoshima somewhere. So like you're 300 kilometers off, so you're really far away. So GPS is kind of a modern application of clocks, which I think is quite fitting the fact that we wanted better clocks for sort of location and longitude, and then we kind of came a full circle and then found a cool application of atomic clocks in GPS. Um, so that's the basic, uh, oh, I had a video. <laughs> That's the basic uh, talk about clocks. Very, very quick. I'm sure I missed loads of stuff. Uh, but if anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead. <laughs> yes, Dan. Who's first? Okay. So, uh, I have a question of describing oh. the time. Okay. So, what, 0 to 12 or 0 to 24? When it happened, that it, did it happen? So describe the time in this way. I think this is really a kind of prehistory thing. We have examples of minutes. sundials. Babylonian. Yeah, so, so minutes is a different thing, but hours is, is, is really old, because we found these old examples where it's just a hole and some scratchings in a rock, and someone must have put a stick in there and used it as a sundial. And we know they're kind of orientated towards the north. So this is 12 hours in a day is kind of prehistory. Uh, but getting on to things like uh, minutes and divisions of the hour, that comes a lot later. Because that level of accuracy in timekeeping just didn't exist back then. But how about 0 to 20, 24? Mm. 24. Well, because sundials were 12 hours. 
And they basically worked from, from dawn to dusk. So they were dividing the day into 12. So it became very natural to divide the night into 12. And so the day-night day cycle becomes 24 hours. Um, and then people realized stuff like, oh, day and night length changes and all these other properties of, of timekeeping. So that's basically where it comes from. More? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, you showed the picture of John Harrison's clock and said that was sort of the first accurate clock. What made that the first accurate clock? Um, yes, so there's a few, oh, one more, sorry, no, oh, other way. There's a few features, um, and basically before this, people had uh, escapements which were kind of based on a few gears working, and the, the timekeeping changed depending on how tightly you wound it and stuff like that. And there were also clocks with these big pendulums that kind of swung a bit wildly and weren't accurate. So it was many incremental things, really, um, things like, um, the accurate escapement, there was, I think, the grasshopper escapement and the kind of regular escapement you can see in my clock if it's going around. Um, that was a big change. Uh, but also materials, they had things like lignum vitae was a big game changer. If you ever play guitar, the really hard wood in the guitar fretboard is often made from lignum vitae, and it's very hard and quite oily. So you don't need to oil it. You can kind of run these um, cogs together, and they kind of self-oil. So all these incremental changes, and probably John Harrison being a bit of an obsessive, constantly spending years and years making the clocks, was kind of what contributed to this accurate timekeeping. Right, yeah, you. yeah. This is the very first one he made. He made four very famous clocks, and the last one is about this big, and it just looks like a big pocket watch. It looks like a very modern clock, but blown up. Uh, so he really kind of developed the, the system. Hmm, more questions. I have three questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you know, have you ever seen that, uh, that recently they found like this uh, ancient Greek device that was... Maybe you're talking about the antique Kythera mechanism? Yeah, yeah. Some, some like uh, ship for, for uh, sailors. They... Yes, yeah, so... Is that a clock? So, good question. It's yeah. technically not a clock. So it's not a timekeeping device, it's a calculation device. And if you don't know it, it's basically, they found it in a shipwreck. It's a bunch of gears and cogs that all mesh together to do calculations about the sun and the moon and, and the, the visible stars, like the, sorry, the moving stars, uh, things like that. Um, but when I see that, and this is definitely my opinion, is I always think, oh, the Greeks could have made some pretty good clocks if they wanted to. Like, if they had realized what they had, maybe they could have made some, some really nice like clocks. But maybe they didn't need to. You know, maybe they hadn't worked out the longitude and they hadn't worked out the, all the other uses for clocks, so they didn't need to. So I think there's a, a bit of a sort of needs and then new technology coming together in the history of timekeeping. Yeah. Is that three questions or one? Oh, uh, that was one. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, wait, no, go on. <laughs> so um, I always get confused that how we measure time one year is like one pound in the sun. Yes. But we have weeks. Sure. And we have um, days in the week. If we say a year is 365 days in a bit, it doesn't map on at all to weeks and days. Because if you right. say 52 weeks, that's no, 364 days. So, yes. and then we have minutes. 60 minutes, suddenly we go to 60 in an hour, and then 60 seconds, and 24. Yep. So it, it, it sounds all very accidental. I think that's kind of because it is. It's arbitrary, and people added on things. So, like in prehistory, people, it's pretty obvious when it's day or night, so people just start counting so days. I guess my question go is it is accidental. Is it good to keep it accidental, or should, is there a better system? Should, should it be uh, more, hmm. or more binary? Is, is so, this, you know, it's an accidental system. Should we keep it? I mean, this is something I haven't really thought about. Um, I think there have been you know, people trying to change things, metric time, standardized time for the world. I think it's, you've got to have a lot of political will to make, change <laughs> everyone's <laughs> clocks everywhere. <laughs> On a more subtle level, you do have things. So you mentioned like leap years and the number of days in a year not matching the perfect solar year. You get things like leap seconds, where scientists are constantly correcting the time signal a little bit backwards and forwards to kind of keep things in sync. 
But I think on the, in the day-to-day, -day, that level of accuracy, most people don't think about. Yeah, so I wonder, is this atomic time, how does it match with our <laughs> it, it doesn't match. And so this is why there are things called leap seconds. So the, the level of accuracy of these atomic clocks is so accurate that they can see that, oh, we went all the way around the sun a little bit faster this time. Or we went all the way around the sun a little bit slower this time. Let's add a second so that we don't go out of sync. Okay. So leap seconds are a thing, and they, they tend to add them every now and again. But the vast majority of people, it doesn't affect your work. You know, if you're doing like a long-running science experiment, you've got to think about that. Or if you're running a real-time computer system all around the globe, you might have to think about that. But your average person doesn't notice. But yeah, we would go out of sync if we didn't do that. I was going to say, also, you have different systems of keep time depending on what you keep time for. So in the computer, we use a system of time where you just count the number of seconds since January, since midnight, January 3rd, 1917. So it's just a number, and it just keeps going up. <laughs> and there's no time zones and no big years. There are only seconds that are packed in. So, and that's what the basis of whenever you look at a web page, it tells you the time. Somebody's taken that number and translated it according to where you are and what you're trying to do. I said, oh, well, where you are now, the numbers of your that you need, it's now five past the ten. So it's just that all these times do exist. It's just we'll have different times for different people. You can even see the amount of times. You could use a different Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I don't know much about the construction of sort of non-mechanical clocks. So they're just looking for something that ticks very quickly and uh, gives you a very, very reliable regular pulse uh, and then counting that. So yeah, maybe there are gains to be had there or maybe the accuracy is given. Yeah, because the standard is the standard time is the second is based on season. Yeah. Sorry, it's based on what? So the, the atoms in the atomic clock tell us how long a second is these days. Oh. In the past, it wasn't like that. But we, you know, because the, our second is basically a you know, day divided into hours, divided into minutes, divided into seconds, if our days get longer and shorter, our seconds to do too, but only on a very, very small level. So scientists start doing things like, well, let's just say this atom is going to tell us how long a second is, so we don't have to worry about how long days are. And also your season clock on the satellites usually control your GPS and ticking slower than the ones on Earth. So you have to start you have to start thinking about relativistic effects uh, and those do come into play. Yeah. Any other questions? I think one or two more questions. Uh Go if on. a zombie apocalypse happens, can I be on your team? <laughs> we'll know exactly what time we're gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I will give a quick shout out if that's all the questions that um, all these uh, all these wonderful sundials and the clock that's going around was all made at the Engineer Cafe uh, on the laser cutter there, and we've got loads of uh, equipment that you can use for free. It's all provided by Fukuoka City. We're in uh, we're just next to Nakasu near the Across Building. So if anyone wants to come make stuff, uh, please do. We also have like loads of other hardware and tech. I made this wallet yesterday, kind of just uh, having fun. So uh, please use all our stuff. Yeah, I think that's about everything. There's one more sundown if someone wants it. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Oh, there's maybe there's a little one as well. Hang on. We could make it the dancing sun penguin sundown. I was I was I was in a big rush and they managed to get the engineer cafe one in. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Well thank you very much.